necessary. Lane Live. This is our alpha cohort. Yeah. Woo! Also want to say hello to whoever might be watching out there on the internet. Um, we're streaming live, so hey everybody, thank you for uh, deciding to join us. And I also want to uh, acknowledge that this is going to be the lead podcast in uh, our lane podcast called Tactile. Tactile standing uh, for transformation, art and culture, tactile. Practical ways art and culture transforms the world. So it's really amazing that we get to start that off with this amazing group um, of brilliant thinkers in our field and this alpha cohort that um, we're really excited to be uh, a part of and learn from. Um, just why don't we, woo! Um, so why don't we do introductions first, because uh, that will be important somewhere later down, down the road when someone's listening to this, right? Um, it, I'm Sage Crump. I'm the program specialist for leveraging a network for equity. Lane is a program of the National Performance Network. Hello, my name is Jonathan Clark. Uh, I am the executive support manager at the Carpetbag Theater in Knoxville, Tennessee. You see him, his pronouns. Hi, I'm Linda Paris Bailey. I'm the executive and artistic director of the Carpetbag Theater in Knoxville, Tennessee. She, her, are my pronouns, and. Uh, Good afternoon. Hi there, I'm Tanya Moat. I'm the Associate Director at Su Teatro in Denver, Colorado, and I use she and her pronouns. Hi, I'm Demia Kambubi, she, her. I am the Director of Community Co Collaboration and Marketing at Junebug Productions in New Orleans, Louisiana. Hi, I'm Stephanie McKee-Anderson. She, her, I'm the Executive Artistic Director of Junebug Productions in New Orleans. Hi, I'm Adonis White-Price. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm the Director of Finance at Junebug Productions in New Orleans, Louisiana. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nina Yarbrough. I'm the Business Development Manager at the Central District Forum for Arts and Ideas, located in Seattle, Washington. And I use she, her pronouns. What's good? My name is Sharon Irene Williams. I'm the Executive Director for the Central District Forum for Arts and Ideas in Seattle, Washington, and I use she, her pronouns. Tony Garcia, Executive Artistic Director, Seattle Cultural and Performing Arts Center in Denver, Colorado, he, him. Hi, I'm Mika Garcia de Benavides, she, her. I'm the Managing Director at Su Teatro in Denver. And we want to say a big shout out to um, Makla, uh, who is our other cohort member, it is, who is uh, based out of San Jose, California, who could not be with us today, but just wanted to bring Makla in the mix because that rounds out the six organizations, the yes. six brave, brave souls. Yes. Okay. Woo! Do you want to give Makla's full name? Movimiento de Arte y Cultura, cultura Latinoamericana. Please. Movimiento de Arte y Cultura Latinoamericana. Thank you. And also, the Myrna Loy um, is also one of our cohort members that uh, is not in the room with us. So, much love to her. So, um, much love to Myrna Loy and, um, and, and appreciate them. And when I say brave souls, what I mean is, uh, we're in three years ago, the people in front of you um, decided to embark on deep organizational change on a journey to think about how their organizations function, um, what does health look like for themselves, uh, and how they can uh, take advantage of the resources of this program called Lane to make those changes. Um, I always say one of my favorite lines or the best line of the opening of any book is Tony K. Bamara's The Salt Eaters. And the first line of The Salt Eaters is, are you sure you want to be made well, honey? Because being made well is no easy thing. And so that's why we're calling this panel Transformation is Necessary. Because it's not just about what's happening outside, but what happens inside the organizations that make the greatest difference, right? So they have um, graciously come in today to share some of what their journey has been. We're, we're, it's a four-year process with Lane, and they are two and a half in. So change is happening. Change is happening. 
So we're going to do this in a couple of rounds. Um, we reached out to the network. We asked people to send in some questions that they wanted to ask um, the Alpha cohort. So I'm going to kind of moderate a little bit of that, and then I'm going to step out of the way and let them ask questions of each other, because that's also really rich, because they're inside. So they ask questions that those of us on the outside, sort of looking in, wouldn't even think to ask, right? So we want to have an opportunity for them to just ask each other things and see what comes up. And then we'll just kind of have a moment of synthesis uh, at the tail end. Does that sound OK? Yes. yes. That sound OK? All right. So um, the first question we've got is, what tools are you using to navigate this time of great change? And I say tools in the largest sense of the word. Right? What tools are you using to navigate this time of great change within your organization? the spreadsheet queen. Um, we were, part of this program gave us some tools to look into our finances in a completely different framework. So one of the things that has been transformative about the Myrtle Boy was the idea that we could use our financial spreadsheets as a moral document to look into how are we perpetuating the structure of the Myrtle Loy to exploit people in order to keep the organization alive. Mm -hmm. So we work on underpaying and overworking everybody because that's the assumption that how nonprofits should work and because, you know, as Rosie has said, that's how we all have done it over all these years. And is that really a good method for sustainability? And so we not only had to challenge our finances and really query into where's the money coming from and how much does this really cost, but because of the um, equity framework of Lane, the true cost is not just in dollars. The true cost is also in how healthy are you as a human being? How, how intent is your organization? How are your structures designed to make you sick or to drive your best employees away so that they can support their families? And when you are looking at long-term sustainability, you have to look at that. And that has been really transformative for our organization and I think for a lot of us. Other thoughts? Mika, I love spreadsheets too. Um, I think one of the first things that we learned in this lane process was that the one of the first things that happened is the nonprofit finance fund like looked into our finances and gave us all of these beautiful spreadsheets and tools to really use. And really, one of the first things we learned was finding. Um, being able to, t we tell stories all the time, that's part of the work that everyone does is telling our stories, but we don't think about making sure that funders and others understand our whole story, our financial outlook, and hearing it from our words and understanding like we know what it is, we know what waters we're navigating, and how to get, um, and the NFF really provides <coughs> empowerment to navigate those waters and to have ownership of that story, so utilizing those tools and being able to um, start to clean up that picture, start to make it come from a better, from not just to understand where it's coming from, from a better place. I mean, the first thing that our, that the first NFF person we talked to was like, fire your auditor, fire your bookkeeper, because your books look awful, um, and they're not being kept the way that they need to be kept, and um, it's been a process, but just having, knowing that I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know that I was right, that something was wrong. So just knowing that I could say, okay, these people are really smart, they know what they're doing, and they're looking at this, and they're telling me that I'm looking at it correctly, and then we need to fix it, and we need to be able to do that. So that's been super valuable in all of this. Hi, everybody. Hey, hey. Uh, I'm new to NPN, new to 
CD form and loving it. Uh, I would say from a um, sort of an outsider in perspective, even though I'm slowly becoming an insider the longer that I'm with the organization, I think the process itself of being with Lane has been like the greatest tool. Um, because I, I came to CD Forum as an intern four years ago when I moved to Seattle and met Sharon. And seeing what she was doing with the organization as a sole employee and then coming back as a hired staff, I can see that the, pro the process of having to go through the lane application, <laughs> LOI, being in community with these people, had, I've seen the transformation of the Central District Forum. Because in that process, what's had to happen is an, is an excavation of everything that CD Forum, and I'm sure the other organizations, what is it that we do? And you have to question all of your assumptions, whether it's financial, whether it's mission, whether it's succession and future. I would say that my, that's my observation, is that the greatest tool has been being in lane. And it, I, it, I think it's a, a testament to NPN and to the Mellon Foundation for recognizing that this is something that needs to be invested in, and hopefully, they'll be able to leverage their own power to get their other fellow large funders to replicate it. Because having organizations go through this process is how sustainability happens, because you have to do all of those things in order to move forward. I think also, I think one of our greatest tools is actually the artwork itself. And um, in, in the many ways that we apply artistic practice to organizing practices, um, applying that internally and externally, I think it's re been really helpful. I mean, for us, I think it's looking at um, communication being one of those things and really kind of improving, improving how we communicate, but also having the space, having being in lane allows us the space to really understand and be able to really I think communicate effectively what it is that we're doing. I'll give an example. This idea around evaluation processes, or as I say, what happens between point A and point B is very linear when we sit and we think about that. One of the ways that we've begun to talk about our work is, and, and the complexity of our work, is that that is not the journey, and the learning doesn't just happen between point A and point B, but with a lot of us, because we're talking about communities of color that either we're working in or communities of color that are leading these organizations, that that work is circular. And if you look at it as uh, revolutions around the sun, that each time it goes around, you're going to find something else in that journey. Um, and that was probably the clearest that I had ever really described what happens and why I was feeling a way about being pushed to talk about what happens between, in a year. Mm -hmm. What happens in a year? Well, I can tell you about what happened in a year, but that doesn't mean that if I apply and do all the same things in that year, that the same outcome will happen. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one of the things that I felt really good about and felt uh, confident in our ability to have those conversations. And this is one of the few spaces that understood that thinking. Well, one of the things for, for Carpet Bag was that when we started the Lane Project, we had um, been doing succession planning. So there, there was, we had tilled some soil, we had dug in, you know, and, and uh, we began to think about what the future was looking like. And um, we, we began from that point of view and what happened in Lane is that we got a tractor, you know, um, and we, we had to learn to drive the tractor and we had to, um, you know, figure out what tools came behind the tractor. And, and, and Lane provided that in the way of um, uh, advisors and consultants and, uh, and certainly resources. But I, I, I kind of can't go uh, just to uh, like the rose without talking about you know the, the soil that was tilled before and, and how we have been able to use that. 
you know, we looked at our, our resource pool, what did we have and what could we build upon? And when we, we did that, then Lane was there to help us build upon those things that we, we had as assets but couldn't use. So that was one of the, I think that's an important tool uh, that we used. I think um, for me, one of the things that I found most valuable as a tool is the idea, the concept of emergent strategy, which is one of the pillars for the Lane program. An emergent strategy is, is a distillation of some movement building values, some of them that originated with Grace Lee Boggs in Detroit, but it pulls on a lot of other um, realms of movement building thinking, including Octavia Butler's work and Margaret Wheatley, who created her book, The Leadership of the New Science. Um, and some of the pieces of that that I've found most helpful is the idea that change happens incrementally and that there, it's a practice and that there are many iterations. And it really changed my thinking about what's happening for us is it is emergent and it's very much adjusting and adapting and moving slowly and practicing and not necessarily getting it right. And it's not, Lane is not like a lightning bolt that just happens and suddenly your organization is changed. It's, it's a continuation of work that you've been doing just with a lot more support. Also the idea that when we talk about change, it doesn't, and we talk about scaling, it doesn't necessarily have to be scaling up and becoming a much larger organization. It can be working in a small context and continuing to work in a small context. And then lastly, that a lot of the change that we're trying to make starts with individual change and individual transformation. So, especially as we're going through this time that is forcing us to shift and to grow, that that's personal transformation as much as it is institutional transformation. And trying to just hold myself accountable during that time to push my comfort zone and to really look at some of the things that keep me from being successful individually and being more vulnerable and transparent about that has been really important. Thank you all. I'm over here like taking notes. I hope you all are as well. There's so many, <laughs> so many gems, so many gems in that from communications to complexity to individual, the relationship between individual and organizational. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna kind of circle back around to, to uh, something you started, Stephanie, around this. What does change look like? It's not like between A and B. And we meet, we have a monthly call in which we all talk. And uh, we had a call, I think it was like in September. And um, I was like, look, I think there's some more money for consulting. We can maybe find some of the folks were like, I'll have enough change. <laughs> I need a minute to breathe. Like, just hold on to that. Stop asking me what I need. Stop. <laughs> oh, no. I need to finish what's on my plate, you know? And so I would love um, uh, to hear some reflections about, like, how to navigate, you know, change. How do you navigate great change, right? Like, is it overwhelming? When does it feel overwhelming? When do you decide, like, okay, I need to take a pause? What, how does reflection play into how you all are thinking about the, the ways in which your organizations are shifting? Sharon's got Sharon's, got Sharon's reaching. Somebody okay. hand Sharon a mic. Um, the, supplies, the surprise reaction for me was um, once we got the change capital was the breakdown as soon as right after that happened. And now not only having enough money and being excited about having enough money, but then being fearful of what that meant. It all became all too real that, um, yes, my budget went from 150 per year and we're trying to push it to 350 per year. I haven't been able to do that in five years and now this is, my, this is what my future looks like. Um, and so I was, I was crying and I was scared and I was talking to my dog and uh, my dog listens. 
I don't know if y'all don't got a dog, but y'all better talk to your dogs. And, um, and I didn't want to accept um, something as simple as the raise that I, of what I was worth. Mm. I started backpedaling on, well, I know we put that in our proposal, but I don't think I need that raise. I, I mean, I've been making it this far. And, um, and so I called one of the consultants and, and I was like, I need to have a one-on-one -on -one, uh, because I don't think I deserve this. And it was like, what? And then what ultimately ended up happening was she ended up saying to me, this isn't just about you. This is about the future of the industry so that the people after you get paid what your work, what they're worth. And you didn't get paid what you was worth when you first came in, but now you're gonna get it and it's not about you anymore. And I said, well, if you put it like that, I'm calling the bookkeeper tomorrow. <laughs> I think you're, I, yeah, that moment of panic is real. Um, and I probably sat for a few months without making any decisions because it's just really scary mm -hmm. to sit and think about. I will say that even before Lane, um, because Junebug was in a pretty, um, pretty difficult transition uh, process. But so be before that happened, we were already thinking about some of the things that um, we were like, if only we had the money to make sure this happens, that Lane just came around at the right time. So we were already sitting down and thinking about, we've got to have time for reflection. And I will say, um, that's something that doesn't happen as much or as often as it should. We all, um, I always give the analogy of hamsters on a wheel, is how the uh, work seems to happen and seems to come to you. Um, I can't say that this was, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy looking at some of the things and asking some of the questions. It wasn't a fast process. It's something that is, uh, Slow and sometimes requires you stepping away from and coming back to the same question. I will say we probably sat with some questions four years ago that the answer we gave four years ago finally makes sense now. It, we were asking the right question. So I think that you know you may ask that question over and over again. Taking, it's, it's about stepping away and coming back to it. Um. When I came um, on board with Junebug, they were already in conversation um, about Lane. So like I walked in in the middle of conversations about um, change capital and dreaming and all of these things. And we were making preparations for when this big change happened and um, when we got the money. But the thing that we, I think all of us can attest to is that you can only prepare so much for change because you really don't know exactly what that change is gonna look like until you arrive in a place and it's there. So like everyone said, when the money showed up, it was like, okay, we know we're getting the money. You got these emails, you got these confirmations that it was coming, and then when it showed up, there was a sense of panic. Because then it's now, okay, I'm in it, and what do I do? How do we make these decisions and move forward in them? So we were in a lot of preparation for the change, but then when the change actually happened, it's like, okay, you step back and you say, okay, is that really the best thing to do, you know, and how to maneuver? So it's some things that we're still learning to work through. And one of the best tools that I found is up to us being able to come together as a collective cohort and have these open discussions about what frightens us and what the next move should be. And if we think that's a really a good way to do things and hiring new staff and making the changes within our organizations to keep up the capacity of what we've been given mm -hmm. and making sure that it lasts. And it's, it's, it's something that we can keep up in the future for those who come behind us. So I think one of the greatest tools is being able to, for all of us to sit together and be very open and honest about our challenges and the things that we're struggling with and how we're moving past them and seeing if that, those things can help assist each other in us growing in this new change that has already taken place in our organizations. Yeah. 
Sharon's calling on me. Um, I, I have not got, we, I'm not, we've not gotten to the point of reflection in, in the work that we're doing. Um, it's called on me to be more of an ED. I'm an executive director and artistic director. And contrary to what I think a lot of people think of, of people like me, is that I actually like the ED work. It's, it's not just administrative stuff. It's, I find that it's a place where you can really craft a vision for a whole organization and, and, and bring all the little pieces. So I actually like that work. In the meantime, though, I've written two new pieces and directed three new plays. So nothing has slowed down. In, in that in that process, uh, uh, it, but it's 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 like a, a great example though of dialectics, in the sense that every every action has a, has another reaction and another shape uh, shape to it. So we've already changed. We just don't realize it. It's like when you go work out, your body's already <coughs> changed from that. You just may not. Oh, you may feel sore, but there's other things that are happening already from the moment you do it. It's the same thing when you eat or whatever you in, ingest. So being in the room with these great people was part of that change. Feeling that we had to, um, we had to pull our share of the weight, understanding that we're also a test for other groups coming forward. We had the conversation about, we, we need to be successful at this so that this becomes the standard for other organizations so that we can have advanced the argument of you deserve to be treated this way. You deserve to be able to have that level of work, that level of compensation. Your community, we have a right to this, you know, uh, as, as, and our community deserves the best out of us. So that's a, that's a shape, that's a change in philosophy, it's a shape. I mean, just under hearing that changes it. We haven't seen it, you know, I'm not big and muscular now, uh, but, uh, but the organization is, is, is transforming. I haven't, we haven't stopped to really look at ourselves in the mirror, but we can feel it on a day-to-day -day, -day -day basis. Uh, everybody on the senior staff is required, the, 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 the stakes have upped significantly. Everybody, my expectations have been very, very different. It's like, okay, well, you better go do it. You know, that's, you, I, you said you're gonna do this, I need this by this time. We need to do it, because it's a big responsibility. If we blow this, it's on you, you know, you guys have to suffer for our mistake, and that's not what we want to happen. Um, and our junior staff sees that we're expecting more out of our senior staff, so consequently they feel they need to step up too. So uh, I don't know all the answers to this, maybe in a year and a half from now would look a little bit clearer to us, but right now you're right in the middle, you know, it's like right in the middle of the workout, so all I know is we feel that we're sweating and sweating. <laughs> yes, we're sweating Water and, and we're breathing. <laughs> and we'll see how it happens after that. Made me think of um, listening to you, Tony, when you don't actually get on the scale, but your clothes just fit a little loose. Yeah. And you're yeah. like, okay, something's up, it's happening. Um, I appreciate this conversation because uh, I'm hearing a, a couple of things, and I, I want to highlight that for folks um, who are thinking about their own organizations about what you all are sharing. One, is that you all were thinking about change and priming yourselves for change before Lane ever got here, right? right? Like that, before this, Lane was not what uh, um, pushed these organizations to, to the heights. Like they were on a trajectory and we just had some support, a little bit of wind. But I wanna highlight that because I think that that is, is a testament to, well maybe I'm feeling a little proud around like how like this cohort is great because you all were already thinking about um, how our organizations shift and where we need to go. And that made it so much easier to decide, to think about who's going to be the alpha cohort, right? Because it wasn't um, someone like starting from scratch, trying to figure it out, but just here's a support mechanism for what you are already doing, what you are already thinking about. And um, I wanna highlight that, so if you're thinking about your organizations that you're like, okay, let's start thinking now about like what change looks like. Because when they wrote their, LO, when they wrote their um, uh, LOIs, their letters of intent and their applications, we could see in that information, okay, they're already having a vision for their own organizations and their plans, and, and that was a beautiful thing. Um, the other thing that I love about this conversation is, uh, Tanya started off with the relationship between the individual and, and the organizational. I think most of us, um, and I don't know about everyone in this room, I know most of the people here, or we didn't come from families of wealth or communities of wealth, right? So this idea of having access to large sums is, is, is a shift in psychology 
about how to, because we know systemic oppression shifts our psychology. So what we are actually is working ourselves out of the psychology of oppression into what is abundance for ourselves. And like, that is a part of the work of this. It's not, I appreciate Kristen's spreadsheet. Hey. You know what I mean? And there's also this like inner work that, that folks are, are alluding to that. Um, it's like, so it's, it's worth it to think about just in your life, how do you, how, what does change look like? How do you react to change? How do the people on your staff typically react to change? What happens when you change the coffee in the coffee maker? Because I don't know about y'all, but at NPN, that's a thing. That's a thing. <laughs> Where is the world? So um, I'm really appreciating that for you all. I'm curious about um, what sparks your imagination? Because change is, is something different, but like transformation, like this idea of like, where, where's, where's Nina? Questioning everything, like how do you, what drives you there, right? To be like, okay. <laughs> so I think that, and this kind of will, this is how I've been feeling about all of these questions in the land process in general, is that it's kind of, ide it's kind of easy to dream vaguely to just have an imagination of like, oh, I just want things to be great. And then when you are given the resources you need to have things be as great as you want them to be, then you have to ask yourself the question, well, how do I get there? How do I get to these things? And what, what are the steps necessary with what I have? And so when you start with this easy, lofty dream, I think the imagination really comes out of, all right, how do I get from here to there? That's where I find my imagination flowing. It's like, okay, that sounds good, now how are you gonna do it? And that's where the imagination comes. Dimia, I wanna add on that. I love that, it's easy to dream vaguely. What it um, reminds me of and kind of a picture that I have had, because when you're working out of a, a position of, um, uh, Scarcity, you en envy is a huge part of your emotional landscape. I want this, I want, I wish I had what this theater had, I wish I had what other places have. Um, and I remember this, this um, kind of compilation they made one day, I was little, so this was a long time ago, and they took all of the Miss Americas and decided who had the prettiest eyes, who had the best legs, who had the most gorgeous hair, and they put together this compilation of the ideal Miss America, and she looked really creepy. So, um, I don't know who did that or why, but it was a really, I remember this picture in my head, and it's like, when we are dreaming vaguely, is that really us? I think the genius of the Lane program is that it drives us and reminds us in so many ways how can you be your truest self mm -hmm. as, a, as an individual, as an artist, as an organization, as a member of the cohort, as a member in the NPN network, and in the field, and all those layers work together, and all those visions harmonize with one another. So what sparks my imagination, Sage, is what would that look like in my inner landscape, in the landscape of the Myrtle Loy, in Helena, Montana, as we become more deeply ourselves? And Lane is shaped to bring that out in this and to make us question that. You know, we're um, mostly artists and Administrators, we are, we are, you know, there are some of us who are hybrid organizations and hybrid people, <laughs> and uh, you know, we we can we can imagine so many things. I, you know, it's a mile a minute. I, I was in a conversation earlier, and you know, we were almost about to take on three new projects for our <laughs> anniversary <laughs> year, and I'm like, hola. <laughs> Um, so we imagine a lot. I think what, what Lane brings is the ability to focus that imagination and to say, you know, I am imagining these things, but I know that I can bring together the resources, inner and outer, 
um, to accomplish these things. And um, then to take the imagination back from there and to dream around those things that we kind of can focus in on. And I think that was key for me. I would say it's the, a little bit of an opposite experience. I came into the world one who imagined quite a bit. And through just life and different experiences and being beat down, I lost that sense of imagination. And I'm an artist. I lost that sense of imagination. And I found myself dreaming really small. And, and, I, and I asked myself, well, who am I? <laughs> you know, and, and I'm not even bringing my best asset to the organization, which is thinking creatively. So I think that part of it is creating the space for someone who their best asset is to be able to drink, to you know, to think creatively, and to imagine big and to have the blue sky moments, which we're not encouraged to do. We're not encouraged to have blue sky moments, um, and so this is the thing that I'm trying to get, like as an office culture, is let's dream big. We still have the ability to be very pragmatic, but let's not start at a deficit. Let's start big. And then let's then go back and kind of look at those things. And I would also like to say, this is the place that the innovation happens. This is the place that, this is why you want to be able to dream big, because this is the place that the innovation really happens. And if we were talking about something that was inside the corporate field, this would be a very different conversation. We'd be encouraged to try and to fail, right? And so that's, I, I think, I just kind of want to leave that out there about that innovation. I've been preaching it a lot, but it's important. One of the things that um, I have watched strategically happen at Junebug with this practice that Stephanie is talking about with us dreaming big and then kind of going back and seeing how to make those dreams happen is being intentional about how we produce our work. And I can, I can just share something that's very small scale but has a very large impact that even in our productions, like when we did Homecoming Project, we were very strategic about where the vendors came from, that the money went back into the community and that even where we rented shares from that, the money went back into the community. And it's that, that big impact that we wanna see our communities change, that we wanna see the businesses come back and the businesses be powerful, but that small part of what we did is igniting that big vision. So I'm learning that even in, in dreaming the big vision, like every little piece of the puzzle, every little thing that we do impacts if that big part of the vision is gonna actually take place. So just in my, even in applying that to my, where like Tanya said, the way that we live in our own lives and the, the things that we do in our own lives and um, how the organization impacts how we move and operate in our own lives and it, it, it impacts you on a greater level. So we are doing some of those great works. And um, I just, I hope and I pray that we get to see the floration of it um, and still be here when those things, when those seeds start sprouting up. Thank you, Donna. So I think this is a good uh, uh, segue to our next, uh, just to kind of open questions from each other and from you all, uh, because you left us with this uh, gem, uh, Stephanie, of uh, this question around failing, right? And like, how do we get ourselves out of this binary of success and failure and into a culture of inquiry, innovation, creativity, and most importantly, learning, and continually learning, learning, learning. And so we wanna move into a moment of inquiry right now. And uh, I know there are some questions we'll have of each other, and if you all have any questions, we'll run some mics out here to you all as well. Is there a difference in the atmosphere in your organizations? Can you feel 
feel it in the ear. You said it's slightly for your ear, or is it still too soft? The atmosphere is exciting in, in our space. Um, um, some of you know, and the people out there in the world may not know, when this process started, I was a, a, a one-employee one operation, and now there's three of us. And um, I changed my office into a space for three people. Um, and so we, um, we dance on a regular, we sing on a regular, um, we, we have fun in what we're doing. We encourage each other, not only with the work that we're doing, we give the most high fives and um, celebrate dance, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. We got our new CRM and we was all up in the air and we was partying. Um, <laughs> CRM makes you party. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it was just like, you can feel that atmosphere and you can feel it not only when you come into our space, but you can feel it when we're out in the community talking about our work or when we're, we have programs and we're interacting with our audience. Um, they can see the release. People uh, come up to me and say, you have this glow about you. And I was, I'm like, things are good. You know, it's not the, I'm, I'm not gonna lie, it's not the easiest road. Um, there's bumps and there's roller coaster rides. There's days where we're just like, dang, I messed that up. And we just be like, okay, get over it. How are we gonna fix it? And so, but it, it is you can you can feel it in everything that we're doing right now. Um, the energy is good. Even when we walked into this space um, for our meeting on Thursday, um, I didn't have to cry. I think it was the first meeting I didn't cry. <laughs> you know, um, and I could just smile and be me. And, and be my truthful self, not the one that's trying to say, oh, we're doing good, that, that lie that we always tell when we're struggling, yeah, we're good. No, I can say, nah, yo, we good. So that's how, yeah, you can feel it. Yeah, I wanna add that because the, um, the CRM actually made me think of this. So um, I can definitely feel the changes and the excitement and having more staff, like feeling this added capacity, feeling this team, this core strengthening. And then there are also things that you find yourself having to do that are part of this change process to get you where you want to be that are really, really hard. And for instance, learning this customer relationship management software is one of those things that's really, really complicated. And I remember telling Stephanie, I was like, this really sucks right now, but I can tell it's gonna be really great for us. <laughs> like, and so even that is exciting in the, the painstaking, like building and learning new things. It, it's, it's all filled with this energy of like, but it, we're, we're going where we wanna go. So I'm definitely feeling that change. I would echo both of those sentiments, but also for me, having come from like a, we, having come from a larger organization where you could see resources being wasted in a way that like, damn, if that were given to the folks who could actually do the work and make it happen, like what kind of amazing things could happen? Or when you see people who do artwork that is just like, why would you put that on stage that is offensive, that is um, not truthful or authentic, and you know that there are organizations that if they were just given the resources mm. and the access to do what they already do mm. so good, mm. how amazing would the community be? And to now be in a space where that I can say that I'm a part of that change is probably the greatest joy for me as a new person coming into the process. Because I'm with an organization where I can be proud of everything that we put on stage. Because I can be proud of the partnerships and just the office space. Like to not wake up with a sense of dread about going into a place where you don't really believe in the mission and that you can, as bumpy or smooth as, as it might be, you know you're actively doing good work to not just make an organization good, but to really affect your community. Like we're in a space where black people are disappearing because of the economics of our city and to be part of a legacy in an organization, 20 years strong, um, 
that is actively a part of that in an arts organization. It's like, it's beautiful and amazing. And for me, that's where that, that joy of, like, yes, it helped, like, it's great to have a, like, a salary and it's really amazing and I can live and work in the city, but to be a part of that process and to be a part of that history is what's really, like, that's for me where the joy comes from as a newbie into this, so. Um, so, I've been with my organization for 46 years. And we came from, as Jorge, my, my brother from San Antonio would tell you, we began performing out on the streets. Uh, our first building that we walked into, I mean, I lied and said I had $5,000 in the bank to the city. I told them, yeah, yeah, I got that. And I was lying. And then we went out and raised it. So having nothing is, is, is where we come from. I'm cool if I ever go back to that space. You know, if we need to, you guys know, if we need to do a show, we can find a space to do a show, and we do a show. But there's something uh, knowing that that the change is, is that we can I can say okay fine let's do that and I know we'll get, that we have it. We re I'll give you a concrete example. We received one of our, our pieces of money was for some marketing money. Now I don't believe in buying. I think newspapers are dead. They and they buying ads and there's a waste of money. What we did is we went to community groups that do their, they're doing their breakfast there or doing a little fundraiser here. And we've been able to underwrite some of their, their events. $500 here, $25, $250 there. And for advertising space in their, in their, in their programs or to buy a table. And they talk about us from the stage, they have our ads, this is our community, this is our home. This is different from us going to them and saying, Hey, can you underwrite our season? Hey, can you be a part of this? And us being, being this place where we take that money from these small groups, rather than now, we can be looked at as a place where, you know what? I can give you 100 tickets to come and see our show. Take all your employees to come and see our show. Because that'll benefit us in the end, because they come and they buy stuff and they engage with us. And that, what I think is, I think you see it as a marketing piece but, but what it really does is it's much more connected with, with the mission. We did, we, we did uh, in the past, you know, we, the Cesar Chavez Day, I think we were getting, they, they were giving us $250 for us to do something with it and we would send performers to do the stuff. This year, we said, you know what, we're gonna give you $500 so that we can help underwrite it and we'll send, we'll pay for our performers to go there. Big change, I mean, the, the, what that gave us in terms of traction was tremendous, plus it was right. That's what the difference makes. I think for us, you know, and, and we've had quite a few changes. We've, you know, added employees. People have health insurance. <gasps> um, but it still feels disjointed. You know, what, what, here's this piece and we we get this piece and, and uh, made it happen and this piece and we've made it happen. But I'm waiting for the moment when I feel flow, you know? And I'm not, I, I, haven't, I haven't felt that yet. And um, I know that it's a matter of making sure that all of these disjointed pieces are in. And it's not, it's not the staff, it's not the board, we're all like heading in the same direction. It's the changes, you know? And uh, we've, you know, we've had some uh, setbacks and the uh, train is moving a little slower than we wanted to. But um, it, I'm waiting for that moment. And uh, I, don't, I wonder if anybody is, is there yet in, in, the, in the cohort. Not yet, but there's something shifting. We're not quite there yet, but there's something shifting. I think the first shift I felt was um, internally, because we condition ourselves to think that, you know, there are real people who are doing this work. So even where, as we're sitting down and talking about the money and the price, there's always a cost to everything. 
there is a cost to everything, and I'm not just talking in the office, right? And yeah. so there, yeah. there is a cost on the individuals who push to even get to where they are right now. And so that first thing that I felt um, that first day was, I was like, we're all, when we got, when the money was in the bank, I panicked first because I was like, wait a minute, something's wrong. And then I forgot that the money was supposed to come into the bank. <laughs> I was like, this is a lot of zero holes. That's not right. Um, I panicked. Um, and then I was like, we should take the day off. Um, and my poor husband, it, like, he was so excited because he's like, this is the first time I had a meal in a long time. He's like, you should get melon money more often. <laughs> Because I felt that internal shift, just a little bit of a breath for a moment, even for a moment. I think what's happened also is that that's been a continuum of a little bit more breathing space, right? And so my breathing's not, I haven't really like just to let go, but I'm finding a little bit more space in here <coughs> to breathe a little bit. Um, but it's a journey. I, I, we haven't, I'm waiting for the flow to start but I feel like we're we are headed in the right direction. Like we're going in the right direction. It just takes some time for that journey to really fully materialize. I think for me, part of locating that flow is really understanding what it means to build capacity. And I think that part of building capacity isn't necessarily around getting to this place where things are easier. It's about growing the capacity to navigate adversity more successfully. So I've just kind of come around to this place of the challenges and the obstacles are never gonna go away, at least in our lifetime, even if we're wildly successful and even though we have values and goals to change the world that we're always going to be involved with struggle but to grow our capacity to be able to negotiate that better and to be able to to take it in stride in a different way that that's just kind of a part of life so that's kind of how I see it in terms of flow is is not perfection it's flow is knowing that you can make it through whatever's going to come up. I feel like I'm talking too much, but um, in that flow, I have to really look humbly and from a, you know, this is kind of a confessional moment. One of the obstacles, I think, to our finding flow is there is a certain culture of poverty that our organizations always operate in. Um, I grew up, I'm the child of a minister and my mother, my mother said, as a minister's wife, you always expect to be poor and busy. And I thought, well that was a perfect skill to grow up with. And, uh, <laughs> and having gone through a real financial crisis, you know, Sharon and I were like in lockstep, like holding each other's breath too. Um, so we were already in our rebuilding moment um, or rebuilding struggle when we entered the Lane program. We had to really acknowledge that sense of almost PTSD in the culture of the organization, wow. the board and the staff was traumatized by that long, persistent danger and all the hits that you keep taking when you're in that position. And that really affected my psyche as a leader. So um, I still am leading from that position and I have to stop. I couldn't take the raise because it scared me to think about when the lane program is over, what I'm going to have to come up with that money. I can't get myself out of that sort of, I got to throw myself in front of the, you know, I got to have my body be the bridge that the train runs across, to get across this span. And that's not healthy and it's not good leadership. And I have to start recognizing where my own personal fears 
are not allowing the organization to flourish. So there is this joy, and there's this excitement, and there's this other thing that we all, I think, share and have to, it's part of the challenge. I, I appreciate it, because I just want to highlight, because you're saying you're talking too much, but you drop gems. One of the things you said on Thursday was um, that you recognized that you were prepared to lead the organization as it was. And so that in the midst of great change, you realized you had to become a different type of leader for the organization, for the organization it was becoming, right? Like for the organization that was being born out of this change. And I thought that was really a, a, an insightful moment as, as a leader who's going to navigate change. It's not as if you're going, whatever you've been doing that's been great so far, as the organization changes, that also means your leadership shifts in how that. Yes, that's really real. Um, and I was going to say something else. But since you said that, um, mm -hmm. the, the whole thing of not having a staff, now having a staff, and used to being able to do everything yourself. And you know you still can do everything. And then as you start to hand stuff off, you start to question what's your value for the organization because you're no longer doing everything. <laughs> And you have to shift your mindset of, oh, I can just sit back and oversee the process. Oh, I can allow them to do it. Okay, so what am I supposed to be doing? And you have to constantly remind yourself, okay, now that they're doing that, you can do this thing that you've never been able to do before. You can leave the office, go out in the community, and not worry about checking in your email a hundred times because you can actually be present for that that conversation with that new partner or present for that potential funder or donor in those conversations. And so for me, as a leader, and it's not that I hadn't led staff before, <coughs> it's just I hadn't left, led staff in this situation. It was me and my board. And it was, it was creepy and it was scary. And some days I would just disappear and be like, I'm, I'm at home, I'm good, y'all cool. But I'm really trying to learn that that process and get yourself back into the game. Um, and at the same time, back to what Chris was saying, um, before I took this job, I was doing something else and somebody said, you have to be, my, one of my mentors told me, you have to be okay with failure. You have to be willing to fail. You have to love what you do so much that even if this or that doesn't work out, that you're okay because you loved it. And, and I take that with me and I repeat it over and over again. Um, and as we're moving through this workflow, now my eyes are trying to be in this moment, but at the same time trying to keep myself from going too far in the future because that, that's scary. So how do we build right now, learn what I need to learn, put the systems in place for my organization, but also remind us that um, this, this is going to continue in some way, but not in the exact same way. And then that's another leadership change. Mm -hmm. So being adaptable as you go through the process. And I think uh, one of the things uh, is, and it goes along with that fear, is being risk averse, right? So um, we have been around, we're going to celebrate our 50th anniversary Woo! next year. And when we looked at our financials, you know, we were like, oh, you have, you know, so many months of something in the bank. Well, that's because I didn't do this and I didn't do that. And I, you know, I didn't take risks because I was fearful that we wouldn't have what we needed. If I spent this, we wouldn't have what we needed. And it's, it's crippling, you know, and, um, I'm getting over it. I'm, you know, we spend this money. <laughs> we got health insurance, <laughs> but um, you know, it 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 does, and these are you know these are psychological problems that uh, we have to overcome. I just want to say to that risk. No, there's something real about that risk. We are not. And this is, gets to that system change corporate world, that risk can happen all day, every day, all the time. Mm -hmm. In some other white-led organizations, that risk and that failure can happen all day, every day, all the time. Mm -hmm. It is real. You 
because if we fail, there's a lot more at stake. There's a lot more at stake. So I feel like as, as a leader of an organization that's black led, that that is on our shoulders all the time. All the time. And we bring that in with us is that this isn't about just us. If we fail at this, there may not ever be mm. something else like this. And so that's a heavy burden mm -hmm. to carry. And it's true. It is not just happens. We're not just saying that. Yeah. It's true. And so it makes you afraid of what that risk because the cost, if you fail, is so great and so deep. And it's the thing that I think that Lane is trying to is, is trying to lay out <laughs> is the systems change the systems need to change and and hopefully these I mean we have all said it I think we have all said that in these meetings and that that is exactly the kind of information philanthropy and other fields need to know is that the system needs to shift and to change because or we will carry that burden all the time and we'll always be afraid to be of risk and if we're afraid of risk then we're scared afraid of failure if we're afraid of failure then we're not dreaming and that innovation never comes i i appreciate that stephanie because i feel we, we've been spending a lot of time talking about inside organizations but this idea of transformation is necessary it's not just the organizations themselves right one of the things we talk about is where, that Lane is not designed to create an arts version of the Talented Tenth. It's not designed just to make 12 healthy arts organizations because you can't take a really healthy fish in a fishbowl and pour it into a polluted pond and expect the fish to thrive. But that we have to intentionally be pushing against the systems, pushing against Plan 3 around, around making sure that our humanity, our dignity, our value, and our space is equally um, as recognized everywhere else so we do have the same access to try, to try. Who doesn't want that? That's a basic thing, to try something and feel like we can. I think that's one of the, the biggest things. Like that's what I was like what I was talking about Thursday. I didn't wanna I didn't wanna get all like morbid and be like, look, we gotta succeed. If we don't, it's never happening again. But it that's that's how it feels and that's and that's what it is. So I was like I that was what I phrased. I said like success is We've got to have a really strong determination for success. And that was the goal, like to make sure we change ourselves and make sure that we, we complete the change. And the change is be, it actually is noticeable from the outside in. Um, and that was, I think, with Linda and I, with the transition with succession planning, I'm more eager. Um, and, I, and with Linda having that wisdom, having years, having decades of experience, Knowing what it's like to have no money in the bank and trying to and skipping a paycheck so you can make sure that your artist gets paid like that. I never want to go through that again. I will, I'm, and I, I'll be damned if I do it again. But I know that having Linda with those experiences and having me saying we got to make decisions, we have to make decisions. It's we're finding that medium, and that's why it's kind of we're finding that middle road. And I, and I know if we, I'd already had the money spent if it was just me making decisions. But I know it would also, I mean, it would have been, we would have been doing like what, like what has to be done. It wouldn't have been just throwing money away, like just lighting it on fire and saying, oh, we got it, why not? But it's also gonna be like Linda, Linda's voice of saying like, hold on, <laughs> slow down, pulling the reins a little bit and just saying, all right, let's make sure this is steered the way that we need to go. And I feel like that's a really beautiful, um, mixture and a beautiful kind of pair of what we have. That dichotomy is a, it's a strange one, but it also makes for uh, really good decisions to come out with what we, with what we're able to to come with together. So I'm I'm a little terrified of what's going to happen when Linda's not around. I just want y'all to know, but Linda's going to be around for a long time. <coughs> So I just, I wanted to offer kind of kind of dovetailing with what you're saying, Jonathan, is that <clears throat> on, the, on the, the reverse side of that is that we get to be an experiment. We get to be a, a place where, uh, where we can pull others with us. Um, we were in the, in the bigger meeting, we were all talking about succession and transition. And in Denver, there's probably about five, six major Latino arts organizations. 
the in their leadership, the longest leadership position they have on is like three years. One of them. I mean, they've all transitioned. They're all three years or less in the ED position. So Teatro is in a different position now of being able to go to those guys and say, hey, maybe we have some resources, maybe we have some mentorship, maybe we've learned from this process that we can actually, and not just, I mean, we, I, I, I do not believe that it has to be with only, only within our own communities, but other communities to say, hey, this is what we've learned, this is the way we can move forward, these are the possibilities, and to make what we're doing the norm rather than the exception. And the other piece of that is that, it's, and other people have mentioned is that within the dominant culture, that's where they live. You know, you ever go into somebody else's house and you go, damn, this is, <laughs> I remember going to a school out in the suburbs one and they had everything. It's like, what the hell, it's like another world, right? And they go, oh, we're not wealthy, we just do okay. But, but we live in this other place, but if we can bring people into the house. I, this is one of the things is that, this whole piece of raising our capacity is, is one, I, I teach in the Chicano Studies Department at Metropolitan State University. And one of the things I try to tell my students is that, you know, one of the, the most transformative pieces of legislation was actually the GI Bill. Because the GI Bill allowed for working class and people of color to start going to the university to use education as a tool for social mobility. So it was an infrastructural change. And in, in some ways, what we've got and is opportunity to go and take whatever transform transformative uh, experiences and structures that we have and and share those with our community so that's that it, that it spreads out and it, it has a life long beyond the times that we're here working thank you Tony I think that's a, a, a part of a, a wonderful segue in a transition and, and actually following you was perfect because as I was listening to while I was thinking back to what Demia said earlier about creativity being inside the practice and that movement history tells us that it's not always one thing that makes the shift. So I hear y'all talking about your fear of failure and like it will never happen again. No, it may not, but something else will. Because mm -hmm. the movement doesn't stop, right? So we'll keep trying and we'll keep trying something else and something else. Right now we're in lane and we are rocking it and you all are brilliant. And thank you so much for your courage for sharing today and all that you all have offered. I hope you all catch up with these folks. And for those of you who are watching live um, and also listening on the podcast, please continue to listen and follow. And we're going to have uh, Monica, Dumia, and Jonathan give us a synthesis moment so we can hold on to change for ourselves and, uh, and the world and the work that we do. Thank you.